Greetings everyone, this is Brock from Spot Connection with the first installment of a brand new segment of this channel called Armchair Developer. Now, similar to Armchair Producer, even though I'm not sitting in an armchair, Armchair Developer focuses on, a, on kind of you know, how I would have done something, how done, you know, in the, in the case of developer, various things from, from gaming. A lot of the time, yes, I will be focusing a lot on Hero Clicks. It's the game I'm probably most, most active with, but occasionally there will also be um, maybe a Dungeons & Dragons based one. Maybe some based on video games. We'll see. To start the, the segment off, though, we'll be looking at, uh, well, the various attempts by WizKids to bring Star Trek into Hero Clicks. So, um... Starting, this is going to be kind of split into two separate parts. One is one talks about what has been done, and then we'll talk. We'll get into how I would have done, how I would do certain things differently. So, um, the first two major releases from in Hero Clips for Star Trek were. Uh, the first wave of Star Trek Tactics, which focused on ships instead of characters. In fact, here's one of those ships, Battleship Enterprise. This is actually an organized play uh, prize piece for a sealed event. I believe it's from the third, second or third series of, of uh, Tactics. Um, it's based on the uh, Enterprise D as it appeared in the Next Generation episode, uh, Yesterday's Enterprise. And Star Trek Tactics basically would have about a dozen, maybe tw a dozen or so, maybe maybe more. I actually didn't really look too deeply into how many were in the, each wave. Ships, as well as usually a four or five ship uh, starter set. And they actually worked just fine with... Uh, In Hero Clicks rules, it gets a little wonky, especially when you see a ship with charge. But, you know. Um, then there was the first Star Trek Away Team release, which was based on the first of JJ of the three J.J. Abrams directed slash produced Star Trek films. Um, this Fast Force is basically just, you know, had the bridge crew from the movie based on the likenesses of the cast from said movie. Um, I've seen it. I, I've seen the starter. Um, never bought it. I, I, it's not like I dislike the Abrams movies. It's just that I don't care. Um, plus, with there, with there only being that for the Kelvin universe, it, uh, yeah, my interest is kind of meh. Kind of the same reason I haven't bought the Orville starter, because that's all there's going to be is just the starter. At least I presume as much. Then, in 2017, Star Trek Away Team got brought back, this time with a full booster, well, full booster set, focusing on the original series, as well as a Fast Forces, which featured uh, most of the bridge crew. I think Chekhov was the only one not present in the who isn't present in the uh, Fast Forces. Uh, this was followed up last year by, well, first off, after the release of the original series Away Team set, WizKids announced they were planning, that they were, they were developing a uh, Next Generation Away Team set as well, which would be a booster set. It got, there were vague, it was, it was very vague when they, they were, WizKids was very vague when talking about the release, well, when it would release, and when it finally did, instead of releasing as a booster set, it released as a pair of uh, fast of gravity feeds with a fast forces release as well. Um, the gravity feeds uh, were split up as being resist 
Resistance is Futile, which focused largely on Starfleet and the Borg, with a, with a little bit of Klingon flavor at, added in, as well as just some... Um, oh, as well as the Q, and some others. Uh, for example, um, Armist from Skin of Evil was in there. Uh, yeah. And then we got To Boldly Go, which focused much more heavily on Klingons and Romulans, as well as introducing the Ferengi and the, and the Cardassians. Um, they're, they're you know, not bad sets at all. Uh, so a breakdown of the, of the original series set, you had 13 commons, 12 uncommons, 11 rares, 10 super rares, and 4 chases. Uh, the 4 chases being Khan, uh, Kang, uh, from the uh, from the original series episode, Day of the Dove, Kirk with a torn shirt from, you know, like, a third of the episodes, and Sulu without a shirt and with a fencing foil from, uh, the Naked Time, if, I, if I'm remembering the title correctly. I'm pretty sure the uh, original series was The Naked Time, Next Gen was The Naked Now. Um, but yeah, 50 figures, including the chases. So, 10 shy of the normal non normal size of non-chase of a set without ch not counting chases. As for Resistance is Futile, you had 9 commons plus a prime, 10 uncommons, 9 rares, 5 super rares plus a prime, and 2 chases. Um, the presence of the primes and their placement lends a, a degree of credence to the idea that um, the, uh, the, the set was initially designed to be a next generation booster set. As to boldly go, features nine commons, seven uncommons, which include a prime, eight rares, which also include a prime, four super rares, and two chases. So, and all, each of these, all three of these sets also included title at least one title character, if not more. Um, in fact, this is one of the title characters from the uh, original series set, Core. From the classic Trek episode Errand of Mercy. Uh, Core would later appear in, uh, th I believe, three episodes of Deep Space Nine Blood Oath, The Sword of Kalos, and I, he also had an appearance in the, in the final season during the Dominion War as well, which basically. Was, the episode was basically designed to finish Kor's story. So, how would I have done the sets differently? Well, with the original series set, let's up it to from 50 figures including chases to 66 including chases. That gives us two more chases and quite a few more uh, slots. So, six, 16 common instead of 13. What do we replace? What do we add? Well, a generic Starfleet Commodore, Yeoman Colt from the original pilot, The Cage, Dr. Haskins, also from The Cage. In the Uncommons, we get Sarek, and a fun thing here would be to reuse, to basically use the same sculpt for the, the Romulan Commander figure for Sarek, as both were played by Mark Leonard. Uh, then, number one, who was... Christopher Pike's first officer in the original uh, Pilot the Cage. Commodore Pike from uh, the Menagerie. This would actually, he would actually be a unique and would have some really hardcore bonuses for to dish out to Starfleet, but he'd also have zero attack value and zero damage. And low, combined with low speed value, he, he Basically, the stats would suck, but the powers would kind of be like, hey, okay, yeah, your stats suck, but damn, you're worth the points. Um, 
And for our final uncommon addition, Her Harry Mud or Harcourt Fenton Mud. One or the other. It would be possibly the figure would be named Harry Mud, and then the card would say for the real name Harcourt Fenton Mud. Um, for those unaware, Harry Mud is a con artist who, who appears in two episodes of Classic Trek, as well as two episodes of the animated series. He has since the character has also since appeared in um, Star Trek Discovery, where he's played now by Rain Wilson, and he's a bit of he's a bit darker. Well, he's a much more he's a much darker character on Discovery, which is fitting because. Discovery is a bit darker than classic Trek. Or really, most Trek. But uh, like I said, Harry Mudd was, was a con artist. Um, he once tried selling um, basically sex droids to miners. Yeah, he, he's... He's a con artist. He's a, he's a decent con artist, but yeah, he seems to always get busted by you know, someone. Then we get 16 rares, so this means we get, okay. We got five rares to add. So we've got Mr. Spock from the Cage, um, Cyrano Jones from the Trouble of Triples. Cyrano Jones being the uh, the entrepreneur who happens to be carrying a lone triple with him and basically sets into motion the whole infestation of the of the space station K seven as well as the U.S. Center as well as the Starship Enterprise with well triples and I I, am, I figure he could have he would have a uh, A means of creating a di of creating a triple bystander, which could then, as a free action every turn, create an additional one. Uh, next up, you have Elizabeth Denner from the show from the show's second pilot, where no man has gone before. She provide act she actually provides something that you wouldn't see much of, which is some mind control. Finally, you have Gary Mitchell. And I was originally going to make Mitchell one of the super rares, but I instead opted to put him in the to make him a rare because, well, when changing up the super rares, I ran out of room, and in fact had to had to drop one of the super rares to rare, that being Shauna from the episode, the Game, Game Masters of Triskelion. Uh, removed from the list, however, are from the rares would be Mirror of Spock, for reasons that we'll get into later on. So, 12 super rares, uh, the four chases, Khan, Kang, Shirtless Kirk, Shirtless uh, Sulu, they would all be super rares. Um, as for what we would end up getting, well, we get a little nod to the, with the chases, we get a brief nod to the animated series. There does exist a Star Trek animated series, after all. Um, it's, there is, yeah, it's not bad, it really isn't, and it, it, it does feel much, very much like the original show, but kind of, you know, kiddified it a little bit. The plus side to the animated series is that there were things that they could do on, this, on the animated show that they could not do on the live-action show. For example, well, three of the uh, chases are prime examples of things that they could not do on live-action at the time. First off being Lieutenant Mares, who um, I do not remember the her ra what alien race she's of, but basically she's a, a cat person. Uh, she have you know 
Should be definitely what you'd expect from a, basically a, an anthropomorphized cat. Claw blades, you know, probably some super senses, maybe a, a nine lives, you know, maybe even a kind of, well, probably not some nod to nine lives, but yeah. Next up is Lieutenant Eriks, who, again, I don't remember his race, but he had three arms, and I want to say three legs. Made for an interesting, uh, you know, I feel it would make, I feel like it would make for an interesting dial. Uh, Lieutenant Eriks was, um, if I remember correctly, he was the show's replacement for Chekhov. Uh, due to budgetary constraints, Chekhov w w was not was not used in the series. Um, and in fact, initially, there was a plan to not to have to not have Michelle Nichols and George Takei voicing Sulu or well, her and Sulu, but apparently none of the voice stepped in and said, "No, I, like okay, if you don't get George and Michelle, you don't have me." Part of this was in part due. Part of this was due to financial troubles that Takei and, and Nichols were having in the at, you know, after the cancellation of Star Trek. Next up, we have Alik Alm, who was a um, how exactly to put an anthropomorphized bird character, bird scientist. Feathers, wings, beak, but. Functioning humanoid arms and legs as well. Uh, it, it's a, he actually has a pretty neat design. So, and he, but he would also provide something you, you, that you don't see, you won't see much of in a Star Trek set, which is flight. Next up, we have Commander Thalen from the episode uh, yesteryear, or I think um, it was a time travel episode, and basically something goes something goes wrong. Something has gone wrong in, in the past. Somehow Spock has died as a child and therefore was never aboard the Enterprise. Commander Thalen was his Endor was the Andorian first officer of the Enterprise in Spock's place during this time during this timeline. But Spock manages to go back, fix the trouble, or fix the fix the timeline. And remain as and go and basically set things right. And when he returns, Thalen's gone. And yeah. And finally, our last two chases would be Kirk and Spock from the episode of Muck Time. Basically, it would be Kirk and Spock holding Lir uh, the Vulcan Lirpas. Um, I imagine the sculpt designs would kind of, would be kind of set up similar to the. Uh, Um, Civil War OP kit figures of Captain America and Iron Man, where they're designed in such a the sculpts are designed to recreate the cover of Civil War number seven, or at least their portion of it, with Iron Man standing on a piece of rock, arms out. This. But the other portion I don't have at handy is obviously Cap holding up his shield, and in fact, you could if you put them next side by side, you could actually somewhat recreate that. But yeah, the idea with Kirk, the Kirk and Spock and Muck Time figures would be to have them, you know, arranged very much in battle poses that, if side by side, it would look like they were potentially battling one another. Next up, the Next Generation set. Well, one, again, looking at this as a potential booster set and not as a gravity feed set. So we got the, we actually just upped the set size entirely uh, from however many were in the two gravity feeds. I actually don't remember doing the count or what the count was. To a total of 68. Uh, common, uncommon, rare, super rare figures plus six chases. So we'd have eighteen. We have eighteen commons, and in fact, there wouldn't be any additions to the commons. 
there are 18 commons plus one prime. That's how it is. Next up, we have 18 uncommons, which means we would be adding Gullivec, um to the Cardassian pool. He was a, he's, I think, the, if I remember correctly, the only Cardassian that appeared multiple times on Next Generation. Um, he was introduced, I believe, in the episode Journey's End, wherein it was the Enterpri after the Enterprise is sent to relocate a Federation colony that's in the demilitarized zone between the Federation and the Cardassian Union. It had, before the treaty, it had been a Federation colony, but now it's in, well, basically, it's, it falls on the Cardassian side of the border now. So, of course, they don't want to leave. At the same time, Wesley is, is there on, on leave from the Academy. And this is also the point where Wesley ends up becoming a traveler and going off and exploring space with the traveler, the other traveler. Yvette would later appear in a two-part episode that dealt with the, uh, with the Maquis. Maquis being the, the, the citizen, or the the people who lived in those in various Federation colonies that, after the treaty with the Cardassians, ended up living now living in Cardassian space. They, the Cardassians did when they when they refused to leave. The Cardassians tried to con, convince them to leave, and that emboldened a lot of them. So they joined together and made a resistance faction and, and fought off the Cardassians. Evek later, Evek appeared with that, having been injured in a, in a Maquis assault and being, aided, and being aided aboard the Enterprise. Um, but yeah, moving, he'd really just be a, he had leadership, toughness, Energy explosion, maybe psychic blast, one or the other. Um, next up, we have 18 rares, which we're going to be adding three rares. First off, we'd add Damon Tog, who was um, one of the various Ferengi Damons that appeared on uh, Next Generation. After Next Generation, the Ferengi Daemons never, no Ferengi Daemons ever really showed up. Um, but, but Tog, if I remember correctly, kidnapped Riker, Diana Troy, and Troy's mother, Waxana. Um, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly. And the idea was he wanted to use Waxana and Diana's empathic abilities as their well, as Waxana is a beta, beta zoid and Diana is half beta zoid, to, well, basically help him, to give him an edge in business negotiations. And there's actually been a meme inspired from the episode in question. Um, it's got, it, it's Picard, you know, reaching out with his hand like that and talking. Um, he quotes some Shakespeare to to Tog to, you know, make him think, oh, yes, I, I, I'm Lakshana's jealous lover, and uh, if you don't return her to me, I, I'll be forced to not only destroy her, but you destroy your ship as well. Um, then we get Gull Set. Gull Set was a, a another Cardassian who popped up in uh, the episode The Chase. During that episode, um, Card's mentor, uh, Richard, Dr. Richard Galen, uh, an archaeologist, came to him and said, "You know, hey, I, you know, I've been tracking this odd thing. You know, it's this DNA puzzle. Um, turns out he's not the only one going after it. 
the Romulans are interested, the Cardassians are interested, interested and the Klingons are interested, interested too. So, basically, the, what it basically boils down to is that you had an a super ancient alien species that seeded various planets in the universe with what, what with what would end up with the primordial ooze that would become the the dominant species on those planets. And among the, the planets visited were Card what what would be at that point Cardassia Prime, Vulcan, Earth, and Kronos. And finally, for the rares, you also have the addition of Gulmuset. Gulmuset was the first Cardassian to appear on Star Trek. Um, he was played by actor Mark Lambo, who actually played a much more prominent Cardassian later on on Deep Space Nine. Um, and Masset and Nukat are wildly different characters. Masset is actually, you know, a good, you know, you can tell he's a good guy. He's actually trying, you know, this is the early days of, of Tree. He want, you know, and he would prefer for that, he would kind of prefer that, you know, the Tree hold done that the Federation of the Cardassian Union not go back to war, even if it is just a cold war. He'd rather not have to think about having to, you know, constantly be on guard for the Federation saying, you know what, screw it, we're heating this bad, this bad boy up. Um, now, then we down with 14 super rares. Uh, first off, we would be taking out the Borg Queen title character. Nothing against her, it's just that she's not from Next Generation, but rather from one of the movies, and there's good reason, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, the rare Riker, which was Riker as a Q, would now be a super rare as well. Um, same with the title Picard. Uh, also in the super rares, we have Admiral Riker, Governor Worf, and Beverly Picard from the Next Generation series finale, All Good Things, as well as The Traveler. And finally, The Chases. Now, the chases in the, gra in the TNG gravity feeds were the mirror versions of Picard, Riker, uh, Geordi, and uh, Crusher. Okay, that, that, uh, that, that sounds kind of cool, I guess. But there's a reason to take them out, which, again, we'll get to that later. So the six chases that I, I would be proposing would be the Primo... The Protomorphosis versions of Riker, Barkley, Worf, which would also make for a change on the, Bar on the dial of Barkley, but he wouldn't have the spider dial, the, the potential spider Barkley dial to click to. Um, and also Protomorphosis Troy. Uh, those were the four characters who really had, who had noteworthy changes in the episode. And quite, I can't, actually can't remember the name of the, of, of the episode, but the basic idea is Barkley ac accidentally creates a, a protomorphosis disease. Everyone, and everyone devolves. Um, the protomorphosis version of uh, Riker is basically Cro-Magnon Riker. Sloped brow, trying to get in, get into uh, the uh, the aquarium that holds Picard's pet lionfish, Livingston. I think it's called Livingston. Um, Slope brow, close shoulders. Uh, right, uh, Worf also had a massive evolution into a primitive Klingon, which meant he had nat more like natural armor and venom sacks and yeah. Barkley turned into a human spider hybrid and it's actually kinda really creepy to look at and I I'm kinda glad that the figure doesn't exist because oh god would that be creepy to look at. Troy devolved into a more primitive version of beta of a betazoid um, and it turns out that Betazoids beta actually kind of evolved, 
had an evolutionary track from amphibious species because, well, Troy became amphibious. And the last two chases would be Ambassador Spock from the two-part episode Unification and Admiral McCoy from the series, from the series premiere Encounter. <clears throat> Encounter at Farpoint. So, that's what I would do with, the, that's how I would have done the, the, two away, the two recent away team sets. As for future sets, well, instead of continuing on the path of, you know, going through the various TV shows, follow up Next Generation with motion pictures. Focusing on Star Trek Motion Picture, Wrath of Khan, Search for Spock, Voyage Home, Final Frontier, Undiscovered Country, Generations, First Contact, Insurrection, and Nemesis. Um, there would be a lot more Klingons. You'd also get another Khan, probably some of Khan's followers. Um, new versions of both the original series and classic and next-gen bridge crews. This would also probably be the first set that did not include a uh, Stark, it wouldn't, wouldn't include a starter, or would have an odd starter with, you know, three classic bridge crew and three next-gen bridge crew. Um, then... After the motion pictures, get back to the other shows, starting with the best Star Trek series to date, Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine would begin a new, uh, would have would be done slightly differently from the previous resets, as it would actually be split up in into two booster sets. The first one for the first set for the cause. Would, fe would focus largely on the Bajoran and Maquis. Um, there'd also, there would be also a pre pretty good push when it came to the Cardassians and Starfleet. Um, the next Deep Space Nine set would be the Dominion War and would focus on, well, the Dominion War. Um, we'd, get a lot, we'd, get more, we'd get more Klingons, we'd get the Dominion, we'd get some more Romulans, um, some Major points would be for the cause featuring a title character version of Cisco, uh, Benjamin Cisco, emissary of the prophets. Dominion War would have a title character version of Gal Dukat, who would be Gal Dukat Costa Mojan. Um, also, for the cause and Dominion War would each come with. Or would each have randomly inserted within boosters uh, one of five for the major, for for the cause you'd get one of five of the uh, of the Bajoran orbs and Dominion War one of the other five and there are ten um, there would of course also be a starter set uh, the D Space Nine starter set would. Well, the, the one for, for the cause would most likely have Cisco, Kira, Bashir, O'Brien, um, Odo, and Dax. The Dominion War one would more than likely ha actually be probably more focused on, uh, well, on the Dominion, giving us... Some name Jem'Hadar, Wayun, um, Damar, uh, and the founder leader. Probably, I, pro I figure probably three named Jem'Hadar, or well, two named Jem'Hadar, a Breen. Legged Damar, Wayun, and the Founder Leader. Anyways, after those were done, we'd get 
Voyager. First, which would also be split up into two sets. The first one being Far From Home. The focus would largely be on the, on the Voyager crew and would once again include... And once again, we'd have more we'd have more more Maquis characters because about half of Voyager's crew after they had left the Delta Quadrant consisted of four members of the Maquis. Also, you'd have members of the Kazon, the Vidians, and more Qs. Because can you really ever have too much Q? Next. Voyager would be Dark Frontier. Um, also, this would focus on the uh, the Voyager crew, obviously, but also the Borg would make a, re a return, as would or and all, the Herogen would also make an appearance. Um, the starters for the two, the Far From Home starter would have. The basic bridge crew, uh, the, the basic main crew, you'd have Janeway, Chicote, um, Paris, Torres, Tuvok, and uh, the Doctor. Then Dark Frontier. Dark Frontier would likely have a board starter, which would include. Seven of Nine is a Borg drone. Also of note, the Borg Queen, the Borg Queen title character I mentioned earlier, that would be end up in the motion picture set, and it would be a new Borg Queen in Dark Frontier. Um, next up, you'd have a set based on Enterprise, and yeah, Enterprise, even though it did have a season-long arc at one point, it's also only four seasons long. So, yeah, one set, sorry. However, following Enterprise, remember how I've been mentioning about removing the mirror versions of, char of characters from the uh, original series and next-gen sets? Well, this next set is exactly why. Mirror, mirror. The set would focus on the mirror universe. You have all the mirror characters, uh, the mirror versions of everyone. You know, Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Scotty, Ahura, Sulu, Chekhov. Um, the mirror versions of the uh, Next Gen crew. Also, the mirror versions of the Deep Space Nine crew, including Regent Worf of the. Klingon Cardassian Alliance. Um, but, and possibly the Discover, the mirror version of the Discovery crew would also be the, in there. Though, those could be held off on for the next set after Mirror Mirror, which would be Discovery. Uh, Discovery, as as I understand, this is only supposed to be a three. It's only supposed to run for one more season, and then that's they told their story. So, three seasons can I think can make for a good booster set. And then follow Discovery with Picard. Though I'm not sure if I'd do Picard as a booster set or a gravity feed, just based on the single season. Though they are saying there's going to be a second season, so, you know. Uh, anyway, um, that's it for now. Uh, a quick announcement. Um, my good friend Lucas, part of my Heroclix Play Group, has started his own channel. Um, it's Heroclix Play. So if you enjoy my Heroclix uh, content, Maybe also take a look at his page. Um, it, it's, it's all Heroclix content. Uh, his channel is called um, Heroclix Headquarters, and I will be including a link to the channel in the in the description box. Um, as always, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Links to my Facebook, Twitter, 
Patreon and PayPal can be found in the description box down below, as well as the link to uh, HeroClix headquarters. Um, this is Rock and Roll Spock signing off, saying live long, rock hard, and be safe, everyone.